thank you very much for being here. Uh, here I'm in debt to the organizers of this uh, session for uh, giving me the opportunity and the honor to moderate this uh, panel that promises to be quite interesting, both by its theme, its subject, the uh, significance of the treaty today, and by uh, the, 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 its synthesis, the, the people who take part in it. Let me quickly present the participants of this panel. Um, Mr. Mustafa Aydin, on my right. He's a professor at uh, Kadir Haas University, professor of international relations and president of International Relations Council of Turkey. And uh, on my left, Mr. Ahmed Evin, who has been the founding dean of the department in Sabanji University and uh, is a professor of international relations at Sabanji. And uh, uh, Maria Gabunelli, who teaches international relations at the Athens uh, University, uh, international law, sorry, international law at the Athens University, and who's uh, a while ago appointed as the new uh, general director of uh, ELIAMEP. I think this is her first contribution in a major event in her new capacity. And, uh, I'm very happy to be by her side on that. And uh, Professor Panagiotis Tsakonas, Professor of International Relations at the National University of Athens and Senior Research Fellow and Head of the Foreign Policy and Security Program uh, at ELIAMEP. Um, and we are fortunate enough to have the opportunity to start this discussion by tapping to the vast knowledge and experience, academic, diplomatic, executive, judicial, of Professor Christos Rosakis. Unfortunately, he's not uh, physically present, but he's present online. So I greet him, I thank him, and I uh, invite him to take the floor. Professor Rosakis, we are ready to listen to you. Thank you, Mr. Pichimas. Uh, actually, I would like to start by thanking the organizing committee of this uh, meeting, particularly Mrs. Uh, Ravnelli, professor of the National Law at the University of Athens, uh, recently appointed general director of the MLM, for which I, I thank you and congratulate him. Here. And uh, Professor Tsakonas, who is uh, the instigator of my presence here. Uh, my point of view uh, comes from uh, uh, it involves in the significance of the treaty today the Lausanne treaty today the treaty of Lausanne established a territorial regime giving Greece new territories and depriving Turkey of the respective rights she had on them in actual terms these territories had been given to Greece at the end of the, the so called Balkan Wars through the initiative of the great powers, but they were confirmed to be Greek territories by the Treaty of Lausanne. So the Treaty of Lausanne provides in its Article 12 that, quote, the decision taken on the 13th February 1914 by the Conference of London, by in virtue of Article 5 of the Treaty of London of the 13th May and 15, the Treaty of Athens of the 14th November 1915 regarding the sovereignty of Greece over the islands of the Eastern Mediterranean, other than the islands of Imbros, Tenedos, and the Rabbit Islands, particularly the islands of Limnos, Samothrace, Mytilene, Chios, Samos, Nicaria, is confirmed. Except, and continue the, the term, except where the provision to the contrary is contained in the present treaty, the islands situated, situated at less than three miles from the Asiatic coast, remain under the Turkish sovereignty. The Treaty of Lausanne creates an objective regime, namely a regime at the office, which means it is a treaty that because it contains provisions establishing a territorial regime, it can be invocable by third states and can be imposed upon third states. It can also, it can also be said that its objective character goes beyond its lifespan 
the territories for which it provides for accession of the islands to Greece and the Greek Turkish frontiers between East and Western Thrace will remain in the hands of the recipient aid, regardless of whether the treaty continues existing as a legal instrument or not. In other words, once the territories have been given to Greece through its clauses, they remain Greek irrespective of the continuous validity of the legal instrument which provided for the transfer of sovereignty. It is to be noted that Article 12 is limiting the sovereignty of Turkey over the eastern islands only to Imbros, Tenedos, and the Rabbit Islands, and those islands which are within a distance of three nautical miles from its Asian coast. Equally, with regard to its demilitarization status, Article 13 provides that Greece, with a view to ensuring the maintenance of peace, undertakes to observe in the Greek islands, the following restrictions. A. No naval base and no fortification will be established in the said islands. B. Greek military aircraft will be forbidden to fly over the territory of the Anatolian coast. Reciprocally, the Turkish government will forbid the military aircraft to fly over the said islands. Third, C. Rather, the Greek military forces, it is said, in the said islands, will be limited to the normal contingent called upon for military service, which can be trained on the spot, as well as the force of gendarmerie and police, in proportion to the force existing in the whole of the Greek territory. Turkey has recently changed her position with regard to the fact that Greece has re remilitarized the island situation, and from a simple violation of the relevant clause of Article 13, she has supported the idea that the demilitarization clause of Article 13 is linked to the very sovereignty of the islands. She has enunciated the idea that if Greece continues to militarize the islands and does not do it, withdraw the existing troops, then she will lose sovereignty of the insular territories, apparently in favor of Turkey. This argument is really absurd. Sovereignty was attributed to Greece with no condition at all. Article 12 is free altogether from terms or conditions, and Article 13 proposing demilitarization of the islands does not link the sovereignty with the status of demilitarization. Assuming that the provision of Article 13 is still in force, because I argue that demilitarization is by its nature a provisional regime, which cannot continue to produce effects eternally, ceases to exist the moment when the relationships between the former enemies ameliorate, no linkage of the regime of delimitarization with the sovereignty of the islands could stand. Limitations to sovereignty cannot be presumed, and therefore the argument of Turkey is not valid at all. With regard to the northern islands, the islands of Samothrace and Limbus, which are close to the Dardanelles Straits at their entry point. A particular convention signed at the same date in Lausanne and bearing the signatures of the same parties to the treaty of Lausanne provides for the delimitarization. The reason for this particular convention was that the Straits were internationalized and the powers willing to have free of possible conflict decided to safeguard them by demilitarizing all the coasts of the Straits and the neighboring islands, Greek and Turkish. This convention was, however, at the instance of Turkey, replaced by the Montreal Convention in 1936. This convention gives, give, was given full rights to sovereign to Turkey, replacing the international character of the Straits with the Turkish appropriation. With regard to the fate of islands, the Montreal Convention only referred to the Turkish island, allowing for their militarization and omitting any reference to the Greek island. This omission has a result the allegation on the part of Turks that the Greek islands remain demilitarized. Yet, despite the omission of a concrete reference to them, the islands are free from the obligation to be demilitarized because of the fact that the instrument which provided for their demilitarization has been replaced in total by a new instrument which serves the interests of Turkey. From the point of view of the reasons which led to their being demilitarized, 
these individuals, namely, they need to keep the state free from Portugal. And disappear through the new regime of the 1936 Convention. Something which has been accepted by Turkish authorities at the time of the approval of the Monterey Convention, when the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Trotsky Aras, said before the National Parliament, before the, the, the National Assembly, that he hailed the fact that also Greece has been free from the obligations to the Rosan But the main argument regarding the absence of obligation to be demilitarized is that the legal basis imposing it has been extinguished, as it can be realized by the reading of the preamble of the Monterey Convention. Another issue raised by the Treaty of Lausanne is the question of minorities. Section 3 of the Treaty of Lausanne deals with the protection of minorities in both Turkey and Greece. After the forced exchange of a population is taking place with another the convention, the remaining Greeks in Ireland were more than 100,000, what called family. And the Muslims of Turkish origin in Western Thrace were also in the same number, in, almost to the same number. According to Article 37, quote, Turkey undertakes that the stipulations contained in Articles 38 and 44 shall be recognized as, a funda as fundamental laws, and that no law, no regulation, no official act shall, shall con conflict or interfere with these stipulations, nor shall, shall any law, regulation, nor official action prevail over them. Article 38 imposes upon Turkey the obligation to ensure full and complete protection of life and liberty to all inhabitants of Turkey without distinction, birth, nationality, language, race, or religion. Equally, the same obligations ap apply to Greece. Article 43, which stipulates that, in quote, the rights conferred by the provisions of the present section of the non-Muslim minorities of Turkey will be similarly conferred by Greece on the Muslim minority in Turkey. Conformity with the clauses of Section 3 of the Treaty of Bataan is doubtful as far as Turkish obligations are concerned. After the first incident of the Cypriot question appeared, the relations between Turkey and Greece worsened, and the first victim was the Greek minority in Istanbul, which suffered mass destructions of their property and threat to the fiscal integrity. Turkey considered that the claims of the then Greek government of Serb was an indication of, of a revival of Megalia Idria, and thus provoked a series of incidents in Istanbul. Mobs who were acting under the instigation, or at least the tolerance, of the Turkish authorities destroyed systematically Greek home property. In that era, in the middle 50s, the Greek minority was in the center of great persecution. Act who has led to a gradual annihilation of a considerable part of it. And despite the interference of the United States in the conflict and the efforts of the then Turkish government against the atmosphere, Greek Turkish relations never. Today, the Greeks in Istanbul number less than 4,000, from a thriving community of more than 100,000 before the tragic incident. A quite recent incident of the difference of Turkish government towards over the sensitivities of Greek community in Istanbul and Greece, more generally, is the transformation of just of Hagia Sophia from a museum to a mosque. With regard to Muslim minority in Greece, there was a period, mainly the same period is historically from the Turkish and Uh, professor? Uh, yes. Oh, nice. Oh, it's okay. Uh, against the Muslim minority, such a prohibition to carry weapons or prohibition to drive cars, not allowing them to get driving licenses. In the 90s, these prohibitions were lifted, and the behavior of the Greek government Change drastically. Today, there is full spread of the rights, and one can say that this minority enjoys the same rights as the rest of the Greek people. Numerically speaking, 
the minority in question 3 amounts to more than 120,000. However, there is a still, still a black hole in the relationship of the Greek state with the minority in Western Thrace. The insistence of the Greek authorities not to allow, allow minority people and organizations to use the term Turk or Turkish in the relations between them or with the external world. It is true that the Greek of land speaks for Muslims, but with recent developments in the domain of self-determination, the minority of Thrace in Greek citizens, Turkish origins, has the right to use the term Turk or Turkish. That is also the opinion of the European Court of Human Rights, which found the violation of Article 11 on freedom of association. It was a prohibition of the Greek courts to allow for the use of the term Turkish to an association in time. And as Professor Marco Gordatos wrote in the recent article, newspaper back in the beginning, this trend is a new one, because during the 50s, the then Greek governments have, have accepted the term, both the governments of Papagos and Constantinople. And I complete his saying by adding that Mitsotakis' father admitted that the Muslim minority race was composed of Turkish people, origin people, Omaks, and Gypsies. And Mavrogordatos made the following question. Turkish minority ceased to exist or ceased to be Turkish? The Greek of Lausanne is still a valuable tool governing the relations of Greece and Turkey. Yet it does not cover all possible differences of the two state one. The fact that some special regimes appeared recently, mainly insofar as the maritime zones are concerned, very north, no, very miles, Korean Sea, or the entrance self, exclusive economic zone, etc. Nowadays, in the cell, in the main, in the main center of the differences between the two countries, provoke tensions between because of the particularities of the agency and the existence of a great number of islands there. <coughs> However, the revisionist tendencies of Turkey sometimes touch upon fundamental provisions of the Treaty of Luzan, such as respect of territorial integrity of the Greek islands of the Aegean, which suffer from annoying overflights of Turkish military aircraft or verbal threats to, 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 to uh, or verbal threats, threats of uh, to their uh, uh, territorial integrity. Coming from official lips. And then the amelioration of Greek Turkish relations passes through a thorough and unequivocal respect of all its provisions and the provisions of the accompanying conventions to it. Treaty of Lausanne is a major compromise, safeguards peace and security, and as such should be seen by both parties on the one and the other side of the Aegean Sea. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Professor Rosakis. I think your presentation gave uh, grounds for a fruitful discussion that we'll start right now. Let me just say that, remind uh, uh, ourselves that yesterday and today, uh, it has been made clear that, and especially the, the panel discussion that uh, we just uh, followed before, proves that the Treaty of Lausanne has been, on the one hand, the foundation of national identity, national culture, and statehood in Greece. It was made clear by the previous panel discussion, but uh, the same is true for Turkey. Uh, on the other hand, it has been a foundation of peace that lasted 100 years despite major and minor crises that have uh, erupted between Greece and Turkey, especially in uh, recent decades. Now, the question is, as Venizelos said yesterday, Evangelos, not Eleftherios, uh, uh, the question is whether uh, Lausanne Treaty today can be a factor of rapprochement, can be a factor that would help resolve legal issues, um, disputes between the two countries, or a factor of friction of uh, tension between the two countries. This is the general question, and uh, Professor Rosakis has uh, addressed this particular issues where this question uh, leads to, question of demilitarization of islands, questions of minority rights, and the question of whether, although delimitation of maritime zones is not 
uh, ruled by the Treaty of Lausanne, but that the Treaty of Lausanne as a, a legacy and a spirit could help uh, solve these issues, pending issues, in the framework of international law. Uh, so I would, let me call Mr. Aydin to, it's his first reaction to what has been said and uh, what Professor Rosakis just presented. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for this invitation. Um, let me start with what actually you just said. Um, I was surprised a couple of years ago to hear my Greek friends talking about Lausanne Peace Treaty as a foundation of Greek state, because this was something that we Turks taught in Turkey, exactly in those terms, and it was uh, for us for years until very recently, uh, Lausanne Peace Treaty was presented as a sacred document, not to be touched, not to be talked about, and it was there as a something you know, in, the, in the postal there, and we have to respect it. And it was the deed of the country that established the Republic of Turkey. And from our perspective that nobody could have trusted uh, or respected Lausanne Treaty more than the Turks. Uh, and I remember when I was a student at the university, and I think uh, other my, my Turkish colleagues would also uh, agree with this, uh, we read in international relations, if you study it, we read every one single um, uh, statement of Lausanne Treaty and memorized it, actually. And most of the Turkish arguments and Turkish foreign ministries and Turkish legal arguments uh, against Greece, actually, in debates, were always referred back to Lausanne Peace Treaty. And we were thinking that here, the Greece is always violating the Lausanne Peace Treaty. So it was a surprising to hear my Greek friends saying that Turks are violating uh, Lausanne Peace Treaty, and Turks are wishing to change the Lausanne Peace Treaty. I said, wait a minute, something is happening here. Uh, and in fact, something is happening, of course. It, it's, it's 100 years now. Uh, we have to accept and respect the reality that every peace treaty that are signed, that is signed, are a reflecting of the realities of the time that it was signed. Right? Uh, so we have to, we should avoid judging the peace treaty or any treaty, but Lausanne particularly now, uh, with our understanding of international relations from today. Because this was uh, a peace treaty that was signed at the end of a, a world war. Right? And somebody, I think in the, in the previous panel, somebody says that it was a historical compromise. And I believe it was a, my own wording was it was a balance, it was reflecting the balance of power of the time. Uh, just like uh, any other uh, a peace treaty like Versailles peace treaty or uh, a Paris treaties at the end of the Second World War. The value of the uh, Lausanne is that it's the only peace treaty that came out of the First World War, which is standing after 100 years. Right? All the others are changed simply because the other countries entered the Second World War. Maybe Turkey, because Turkey's avoidance of the Second World War allowed this. But nevertheless, it is the fact that the only treaty that has 100 years behind uh, itself, which is in itself, I think it's quite important. And we have to respect that, the value of the treaty. Uh, and I also believe that it, it has established a kind of a balance which made nobody happy. Uh, here in the last two days, of course, we are hearing mostly, uh, a, let me put it that way, Greek lamentations uh, of some parts of the treaty right? uh, that uh, it created uh, uh, feelings of vulnerability, that created uh, feelings of loss and everything. But every peace treaty, if it's going to be standing the test of the time, has to do that. Right? If one of the sides of signing a peace treaty is very happy and the other is not happy, that peace treaty doesn't really stand for the test of the time. So Lausanne actually made everybody equally unhappy. Which is the secret of its success. That's the secret of its success, exactly. <laughs> because if you 
talk to the Turks, first of all, it's, uh, it, it failed uh, to comply with what we call Turkish National Pact. That was the pact that Turkish uh, nationalists fought for. Uh, they tried to implement the National Pact with the, what we call Turkish Independence War. And that's the, from that perspective that the treaty is being criticized by part of the society today in Turkey. After years of respect in the uh, treaty, but now it's being criticized and some of these questions of whether Turkey is wishing to change the treaty or not coming out of this criticism. And the criticism is that it failed to comply with all of Turkish wishes, which is as I said, coming from a realist tradition of international relations, for me, that's the perfect treaty. Right? It didn't make Turks happy, and it didn't make Greeks happy. Of course, when we talk about Lausanne Peace Treaty, and this is the case in Turkey also, we always think about Greece and Greeks, and forget and ignore the fact that there were other countries who signed the Lausanne Peace Treaty, and I, there are other countries who were affected by the Lausanne Peace Treaty. In fact, there were a number of countries whose borders were created by Lausanne Peace Treaty, and they are not questioned today. So if I look at it, the treaty itself, uh, almost, I would say, 60, 70 percent of it is it's dead now. It's, it's, it's not relevant today. For example, uh, the, uh, the accompanying uh, uh, text like Lausanne Straits Treaty, another text signed in Lausanne, which is totally out of the question today because Montreux superseded it. Uh, again, the issue of exchange of population. It was another document signed in Lausanne, but it's, it's in the historical memory and it's, it's there, but it's not part of the debate today, especially in Turkey, which is very interesting. We have at least two of my friends are from uh, uh, ancestors coming from what is Greece today. But they would agree with me, I think, that this issue of exchange of population has not been an issue in Turkey as something that publicly debated until very recently, which is a difference with Greece, actually. Uh, in Greece, I know this has been debated publicly uh, and talked about, uh, and even today, you do talk about it. In Turkey, except if you are part of this group of people who come from uh, uh, territories outside Turkey, not only Greece, but Bulgaria and Macedonia or whatnot, you would not be interested and you would not be debating about this uh, in academia as well. This is a way of uh, Turkish, I think, culture uh, of forgetting, maybe not forgiving, but forgetting the history, putting it behind, so looking, be uh, looking future and going forward. And this is something I always find fascinating in Greece. No, nothing is being forgotten in Greece. Right? You keep talking and scratching it always. Uh, there, there is this difference between Turks and Greeks. We try to forget it. Uh, that's not healthy either. I'll tell you that's not healthy because political psychologists will, will tell you that you have to talk about it. You have to, uh, 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 just like a human being, you have to um, go through the commiserations and everything to become healthy. But in Turkey, we avoid doing that publicly until very recent. The first thing that I remember, it's about lamentations about the lost territories in the Balkans. But let me tell you first, the, the territories that the Ottoman Empire lost in the Balkans within five years, it's like three times bigger than Turkey today. These are the territories where the Ottoman state was established. Remember, the Ottoman state was not an Anatolian state was not a Middle Eastern state, it was a Balkan state, right? And that's a trauma, huge trauma. The first time that Turkey dealt with this trauma publicly is in early 2000s, a, a, a TV serial about Rumelia, right? And the, the, Rome, uh, the Rome, Elvera Rumelia, right, in Turkish. 
But until 2000s, we tried to avoid this. And it festers. It becomes a problematic issue. Uh, but this is something that I, I, I've been thinking since I came here um, yesterday or day before. Uh, number of issues are still standing, uh, which is affected by the Lausanne Peace Treaty. And a couple of them are already being raised. One is about the minority rights. We have to accept that Lausanne was ahead of its time uh, in dealing with positive minority rights. Because Lausanne Peace Treaty did not provide minority rights to minorities, actually. It provided positive minority rights uh, beyond what was acceptable of the time. Whether the countries, Turkey or Greece, applied them fully, it's something else. It's, a, it's politics. But the treaty itself, it, for, it's, it foresaw uh, a, a very detailed, actually it's too detailed, minority rights. And it, they are still valid today. And they are still part of the debate between Turkey and Greece. Let us not forget that. The second aspect that is still uh, relevant is, of course, uh, this demilitarized status, or militarized now, status of the islands. Uh, and, of course, the borders. As far as I can see, nobody really challenged the borders anymore. Uh, some Greeks might disagree with this, uh, uh, about the latest position of Turkish Foreign Ministry um, linking with the demilitarized status with um, sovereignty of the islands. But I have different perspective on this. Uh, I see a, a, a kind of a, a negotiating position there. Uh, but you have to talk to the foreign ministry and to understand what they, they really mean about that. Uh, but I believe it has created, the, the, uh, the Lausanne Peace Treaty has created a system which is still relevant today for the discussion between relations between Greece and Turkey. And if you look at the negotiations uh, between the officials of uh, the Greek state and Turkish state, they are still referring back most of the time to the Lausanne Peace Treaty, what they got or what they didn't get. And most of the legal arguments on any issue actually starts with Lausanne. So it shows uh, how relevant it is for today and for the future. And let me finish with an observation uh, for the future of Greek-Turkish relations, since now we are looking for the future, actually, and maybe going beyond the Lausanne. Because if we are looking to the uh, future, we cannot stay debating the Lausanne Peace Treaty in the next 100 years, right? We have to go beyond it. But as far as I can see, uh, uh, from my perspective, Greece and Turkey had improved their relations a number of times in the past. And there are two uh, prerequisites that they are able to do that in these three times. The one was in 1930s. Many people know it, and we all talk about it because it was the uh, the founding father of Turkey and, uh, and also, in a sense, modern Greece, uh, 1930s. But there was this Italian threat, which we heard in the previous panel, uh, from outside. And there was an actually outside power who were encouraging Greece and Turkey to cooperate. That was the United Kingdom at the time, in 1930s. Then, then there was another period, the two countries find uh, expedient to cooperate with each other, which was immediately after the Second World War, 1950s, when there was a threat, common threat perception from the Soviet Union. You had your civil war, and we had our own share of uh, threats from the Stalin's uh, Soviet Union. But there was another country at the time encouraging Greece and Turkey to cooperate. That was the United States. Uh, and then third period of cooperation come in in the 90, 90, late 1990s, after the earthquakes, uh, everybody talked about earthquake diplomacy. But I think it was not the earthquakes. There was this structural threat perception and encouragement. The threat perception this time was different, because the period is different. But the threat perception was, uh, and the encouragement is coming from the same source. It was the European Union. For Turkey, it was the threat of being left out of the European expansion. 
And for Greece, it was the threat of being left out of European Monetary Union. So it was a common threat. And the encouragement was again the European Union. If you cooperate, you benefit from the new uh, era. So I think these two countries, uh, despite all our rhetorics and debates and talks and whatnot, if there is an external threat, common external threat, and if there is an external encourager, we find ways to negotiate and we find ways to go forward. Uh, for that, we have, uh, we heard already uh, uh, Professor Iacomides coming out with some ideas for the future, and I agree with, that, with him that there is a window of opportunity now, again. Starting from the 100 years of uh, Lausanne Peace Treaty, we can move forward with two government newly elected in both sides and not facing elections next for, next for five years, it's a blessing. And we can use this blessing if we can first avoid politicizing the issues between Greece and Turkey, which is very difficult. Second, avoid inflammatory rhetoric in press, uh, which is again very difficult. But more importantly, I think if we understand and accept that any solution between two countries would be less than ideal, would be less than what we, our national expectations are, just like the Lausanne Peace Treaty. If one of the sides are going to get everything that they want, then there would be no peace and no settlement, negotiated settlement. Let us not forget, any kind of a solution is a compromise. I know, at least in Turkish, but I also know in Greek, my Greek friends confirm that, Compromise has negative connotations in both languages. Right? In English, compromise is something very good. You compromise. In Turkish and in Greek, we don't. We have to learn to talk in English, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> I think we need two things for that. I always argue is we have to prepare the public. We have to prepare the public. Because in the recent past, two to twice, in 2003 and 2004, and also 2010, diplomats of both countries came very close to find the agreement. Actually, they found the agreement. What was missing was the signature of the politicians. The politicians to be able to sign a compromise deal, they need to prepare the public. In the short term, we need to have public diplomacy to do that. In the longer term, we need education to change. Education here and education in Turkey, I think, are the biggest obstacles for the future next 100 years of the Lausanne Peace Treaty. Let me stop there. Another 100 years. Another 100 years. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Professor Aydin. It was very interesting. So I. Yeah, I, I was carried away and I was indulgent time-wise, but uh, it was Sorry, interesting. I'm and I, 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 especially the optimistic twist in your presentation was very interesting and uh, heartening. So, uh, Maria Gavonelli, please. All right, thank you so very much. It is indeed uh, uh, my first appearance belonging to both my families, the University of Athens and Elia Mep, and as such, I'm particularly pleased, actually, to be among you and have the discussion that we're having this past uh, uh, And today. also, as a member of the Greek-Turkish Forum, Maria. Oh, you see, ah, that's a promise. <laughs> so there you are, surrounded by friends. Thank you so very much for that. Um, well, there are a few points that I would like to raise, and uh, these are not necessarily original points because they have been made during these past two days. The first point is indeed that the Lausanne Treaty has been uh, the birthplace of the Republic and at the same time the tombstone of the Oriental question and the Ottoman Empire. And I think that is important. That is important because, as Mustafa has just said, um, the um, Lausanne Treaty is a peace treaty. And as a peace treaty, it, it does represent the balance of power. At the same time, however, it is also a treaty, and I'm a lawyer. 
and I go back to whatever it's written in law, and I respect what is written in law. And as a treaty that has designated ba uh, boundaries, that has made sure that it's not just the boundary between Greece and Turkey, but also the boundary with Bulgaria, the boundary with, in the Middle East, Iraq, uh, Kuwait, uh, the boundary to Saudi Arabia, the removal of the Ottoman Empire from Egypt and, uh, thank you, from Egypt and Syria and whatnot, all those things, all those things do create an objective regime. And that objective regime has to do with sovereignty and has to do with power and boundaries. And to change that objective regime a hundred years later sounds wonderfully revisionist. Do I need to remind you of Ukraine? It is therefore something that needs to be avoided at all costs. And I think that we need to uh, agree that that is indeed sacrosanct. So we would need to move on beyond that. Mustafa has very correctly suggested that already a number of issues uh, considered within the treaty uh, have been taken care of. Uh, all the domestic arrangements within the Republic have been taken care of. The idea that uh, you, the, you would have uh, compulsory technical assistance in order to have new codes, for instance, uh, or the idea that all the uh, financial incentives to foreigners have been taken away, all these are already uh, done uh, with no problem whatsoever. There is the question of minorities. And again, here we're talking about obligations, legally binding obligations. We do talk in this country about uh, the refugee problem and the exchange of populations and whatnot. It is indeed a huge social trauma. And we have been talking about that in an attempt to digest it. <laughs> but you see, it was an immense number of people that were involved, 20% of the population of Greece. So it is not comparable to the kind of uh, movements that you have seen uh, on the other side uh, of the border. And we are concerned also because there are still minorities that are protected by the Lausanne Treaty. And because it is a binding treaty, we need to continue abiding by it. So the question here is not uh, somehow a fixation with the past. It is simply the discussion of a continuing binding force of an international instrument that has no limit, that has no expi uh, expiry date. Let me move on to two more points and I would uh, finish. Again, not points that are terribly original because they have already been referred to. Um, uh, just this morning, uh, there was this observation that the Lausanne Treaty was an arrangement of land borders. And it had mostly to do with land as opposed to uh, the sea. It is of course, true that the land dominates the sea. But at the time, it was just three miles. These days, it could be uh, 9, 12, 10, or 200. So it's a different kind of, of thing that we're talking about. And indeed, nowadays, resources lie mostly at sea as compared to whatever it is that we do on land. I would argue, however, that here we see some kind of a return to the past, should I put it this way, or something like that. The whole idea of maritime zones was to move beyond ownership, before, beyond sovereignty, and avoid these discussions of whether it's yours or mine, and move into a question of management, of jurisdiction. The idea, therefore, was a much more functional approach, if you like, the idea that we need to make sure that we have the benefit of whatever resources are, are there. And therefore, let's move on and avoid titles. By just going back to that discussion, by trying to 
make an argument on the continued relevance of the treaty or even the treaty as a prerequisite for the continued sovereignty of uh, the islands or things like that, whether it's a valid argument or not, whether it's a negotiation ploy or not, it would still get us back almost 100 years, not 100 years, but almost 100 years, to a discussion of ownership of sovereignty rather than a discussion of management and jurisdiction. And I think that is wrong. I think that we are going to spend quite a lot of our efforts and time and money, and we would create actually bad will, and there's absolutely no reason to do that. Um, and there is no reason to do that uh, simply because we can use the convention as a springboard for the next 100 years. And therein, if you like, lies the challenge. Um, the Turkish president was talking uh, about the other day about uh, Turkey as an idea or something like that. I'm not using the correct words, but that was the sense that I've got. Uh, that is something beyond the boundaries of the state, which sounds very close to this wider idea of, of Greece as, 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 as uh, a concept. Um, again, that would have to do with the idea, the conception of Turkey as in, within itself. Uh, we, we have seen earlier today the discussion of Turkey moving after Lausanne towards the Western world. And Lausanne was actually the instrument by excellence that was used in order to westernize the state. And we had that discussion earlier today when we said, OK, we see now some kind of a pendulum going back, perhaps, moving away from the west, but not as yet reaching the east. Um, perhaps the shine has taken off the west but there's nothing shiny enough on the other side. Um, it is, at the end of the day, a question that Turkey itself has to decide whether it's, uh, where do they want to, to belong. Um, there has been some discussion in recent times that Turkey would move away from the idea of a bridge between East and West and would develop as a regional power, uh, a cent the center of its own world. Um, okay, I hear that, but that means in essence that Turkey is just about to move away from the constraints of the Lausanne Treaty uh, towards a situation that we don't necessarily know where uh, it goes. And if we're moving away from Turkey as a Balkan state, then what is it that we're looking for? Uh, Turkey as an Eastern state? And I again here, I see this same ambivalence going back in the past. Um, in the Second World War, Turkey was really ambivalent. From that point onwards, many a time, Turkey was trying to move away. Recently, Turkey is actually working trying to stabilize itself on, on, on two boats. Uh, we have seen that in the Ukraine, we have seen that with uh, the surreals and everything. Is that the way to the future? It's a way of transactional kind of arrangement that we're talking about? Uh, I'm not saying that it's bad or good. What I'm saying is that we need to know because we are neighbors and we're destined to be together. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Maria. Um, you, you raised some interesting points, both on Turkish identity politics and its movement uh, in the actual international context. And uh, you made an interesting point too, referring to how we should view the discussion on maritime zones and uh, not as an issue of ownership, but of jurisdiction and management. Um, these are very interesting points, I guess. So let me pass the floor to Professor Ahmedovin. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be in Athens again. 
and um, I appreciate uh, the invitation. Now I'm going to talk about something slightly different. Um, the previous speakers on this panel and yesterday have elaborated on many aspects of the Lausanne Treaty today. Uh, the influence of the treaty on the shaping of the region and beyond. I shall therefore refrain from belaboring these points that have been thoroughly considered. I shall attempt instead to situate the Lausanne Conference in the context of Europe's pursuit of stability in an era of increasingly violent conflicts. This idea occurred to me while thinking about the broader context of the Lausanne Conference, the degree to which it engaged the great powers, which competed with one another to influence the outcome of the talks. It was the last of the seven treaties that ended the conflict in Europe. With its broad ramifications, the Lausanne Conference also has significance for the current scholarship in comparative history, which has attracted renewed attention recently. The last few decades have been witnessing a renewed interest in how conflicts in Europe were brought to an end, how peace and stability were pursued, and unsurprisingly, how the consequences of the collapse of empires unfolded. Let me now briefly point to several of the more significant aspects of European peace treaties as they will be relevant to the Lausanne Conference. With the dawn of the modern era, the old way of formalizing armistices into binding agreements gradually took on a more complex process of negotiation allowing the consideration of how to reduce the threat of similar conflicts taking place. In reality, they rarely succeeded, in part because of the changes in the outlook of the parties or their relationships with one, one, one another. The treaties that punctuated the evolution of the international system have been only the ones that brought a change of paradigm. The Treaty of Westphalia, for example, that recognized the sovereign state as the key actor, also saw it as the indispensable unit for achieving stability. An idea found expression, as we saw in Machiavelli's work, and we saw in practice um, in France under uh, the reign of Philip the Fair. The Congress of Vienna was another watershed that fundamentally changed the international system and opened a new era by introducing the notion of balance of power. And in, in doing so, it superseded a key Westphalian principle of state sovereignty by curtailing the say of the small states leaving the stage to the great powers to conduct the business of security. The continent-wide pursuit of stability emerged, emerged after the Napoleonic Wars that wreaked havoc with the 18th century European order that had already been turned on its head by the French Revolution. The Vienna Congress was thus a major undertaking to return to the status quo ante, and it set the standard for the rest of the century and well beyond it to uphold order and stability by fiat. It also aimed to establish a modus vivendi among the major powers, which the parties to the conference assured themselves would strike a balance of power among themselves by not allowing any combination to form too powerful an alliance against the rest. They believed that, but it did not occur, of course. Metternich's plan for stability began to falter in 1830 revolutions 
and Metternich's own career came to an end after the 1848 revolution. New ground had been broken in Europe for liberal, nationalist, as well as socialist ideas, which would gain prominence later. But conservatism, nevertheless, was restored after the suppression of the 1848 revolutions. On the other hand, the hope of avoiding conflict among the major actors fell short of expectations, not least because the power relationships among those actors had changed and kept on changing rapidly in the uh, industrial era. However, the goal of stability remained constant amid the volatility induced by competition and Prussia's expansionist behavior. A conflict of unseen proportions until then, the Great War resulted in opening enormous new challenges for, uh, for um, uh, the uh, um, peace treaty sector. About 30 treaties of varied importance and duration, not counting the several armistices, uh, were signed after the First World War, the seven in, in, uh, among the European powers only. So that shows the enormous task of wrapping up World War I. Some of these arrangements failed to secure lasting peace. To give an example, the Versailles Treaty of 1919, signed in the very same Hall of Mayors as the earlier one of 1871, when Kaiser Wilhelm declared the newly formed uh, Prussian Empire. The 1919 one was the revenge taken by the embittered French, embarrassed by their defeat 38 previously. They would now insist on such harsh terms for Germany's surrender that at the end led to the collapse of Weimar and the rise of the Third Reich. But the most serious new challenge was how to carve out collapsed empires and draw new borders, which in any case would not be able to accommodate the various nationality groups which clamored for independence and whose ambitions had been fired by rising nationalism as well as by the Wilsonian principle of self-determination. In several cases, tables were turned against those on the losing side. Hungary, for example, lost two thirds of its land and three million Hungarians found themselves within the borders of Romania as a result of the Treaty of Trianon. which is still in the populist repertoire of Prime Minister Orban. With regard to the Ottoman territories, the Eastern question had been looming larger and larger following the Russo-Turkish War of 1877. When the Ottomans ended up on the wrong side of the conflict, the great powers, which willingly brought them into the concert of Europe in the face of the Russian threat, now felt the full weight of Ottoman states' frail condition. By the time the Lausanne Conference, uh, uh, by the time of the Lausanne Conference, not only the conditions, but some of the characters had changed. The Ottoman state had ceased to exist, and the last sultan abdic abdicating conveniently three days before the opening of the conference on November 20. The Ankara government negotiated on the basis of the national contract, which was discussed this morning. A neat, the national contract is a neat rectangle delineated by clear borders. That it had no further claims was a relief for the British and the French who could then pursue their interests in the region beyond Turkey. The time available does not permit a discussion of the issues I raised, but I hope I was able to convey the kind of framework, however fluid as of now, that I intend to adopt for this exercise. To conclude, let me um, summarize um, and emphasize 
three points that flow from uh, this uh, brief um, expose. It cannot be said that World War I and its concluding treaties changed the paradigm of peacemaking in Europe. However, it can be argued that the, uh, the Lausanne Conference operated under the shadow of a new paradigm embracing the Wilsonian principles of self-determination, which were admittedly only selectively adopted by the Lausanne Conference. By 1923, however, Wilson was out and the US Congress, which he had ignored and thus alienated, had no interest any longer in international affairs and certainly not in what it considered to be remote areas of little strategic relevance to American uh, interests. Number two, as for the European great powers, they sought stability on the continent while pursuing their imperial goals in the Middle East and elsewhere. The Turkish position at the conference did not pose an obstacle for them. In this regard, the Lausanne Treaty can be placed squarely in the 19th century tradition of putting a premium on achieving stability. Number three, the Lausanne Conference thus reaffirmed the key principle, key principle of the Vienna Congress in its pursuit of stability, relying on the role of the great powers as sovereign states in creating and maintaining the global order, unquote, as so aptly put this morning by Professor Atsuko Kanehara. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Levin, for giving us this historic background and the uh, 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 of the era of the Lausanne Treaty and uh, the context uh, after World War One. Um, we should keep in mind as we discuss the relevance of uh, the treaty today, which is the issue that I call uh, upon Panagiotis Tsakonas to address. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, uh, my presentation, my intervention is, uh, will, will touch upon three uh, issues. Uh, the Lausanne legacy, um, the, um, uh, a, a question, uh, I put a question about how close or how far are Greece and Turkey today from the legacy of the Lausanne Treaty? and uh, conclude with a, a more positive, I would say, note on um, what does it take for the Lausanne Treaty uh, or for the Lausanne legacy to remain the basis not only for better relations between Greece and Turkey, but uh, also for the resolution of the Greek-Turkish conflict. Um, first of all, I, um, I must admit I, I was amazed but not surprised, I would say, because it's a hybrid of great minds. I started thinking about the Lausanne Treaty as resembling what uh, uh, Henry Kissinger mentioned as the 19th century European system, a kind of a restored world, already mentioned by uh, Professor uh, Evin. Um, there has been a, an exempt from what uh, Henry T. Kissinger, who, by the way, was born in 1923. He turned 100 uh, some months ago. The construction of a stable international order was dependent upon the successful linkage of state interests to international legitimizing principles. Socialization from this perspective was the process of reconciling states especially revolutionary ones, individual aspirations to accept it or agreed to the Vienna system standards. By summarizing what has already been uh, said by various uh, speakers so far, uh, I would uh, highlight uh, certain 
points with regard to the legacy of the, of the Lausanne Treaty. Uh, it is about the compromises, it has already been mentioned, that the states involved had agreed to make. It constitutes a departure from revisionism. Total victory had been put aside. It made war a bad option. And it is well known, it has already been mentioned, a restored world of that kind with a major part of the so-called Eastern question being settled or resolved. And that's very important, a rules-based new world being established, uh, especially in the creation of, of an objective regime, as Maria mentioned, with regard to territorial settlements in land and particularly at sea. So my first question is what do we get when we project the Lausanne legacy onto today's world? We, I think there is a general consensus of that. We live in a multipolar, highly asymmetrical, fragmented, and increasingly a stable world where multilateralism is in retreat, is still in retreat. The European Union is not at its best, uh, although uh, certain things indicate, based on the reserved optimism of Professor Tsoukalis, uh, a coming of age for the EU. And we also experience a renationalization of the foreign policies of the EU countries and a more autonomous oriented foreign policy uh, by others, non-EU states. What about the uh, subsystem of the Eastern Mediterranean when one uh, projects what is been happening in the system in the particular Eastern Mediterranean subsystem where Greece and Turkey coexist but also compete. It seems that there the um, uh, so-called polycrisis, uh, which means traditional and contemporary threats and challenges that evolve simultaneously constitute the new normal in the particularly the Mediterranean by uh, thus producing uh, uh, an extremely unsustainable uh, environment. Yet it seems that there are some uh, good, I would say, indications uh, next to the ones um, I mentioned. Expansion. Expansion is more difficult. Offensive capabilities are in disadvantage. The normative territorial integrity, although weakened, is still present. The regional environment is not receptive to revisionist uh, policies, and international institutions can be used both for soft balancing and engagement. Then I turn to my second question, which has to do with uh, the obstacles, as mentioned by Mustafa, in Greece and Turkey uh, regarding uh, the um, ability of the uh, Lausanne legacy to produce positive results. Um, it seems, and I'll be, I'll be outspoken on this. Uh, where does Turkey stand? I would say a bit further, a bit further from the Lausanne legacy. And there are certain analysts who refer to uh, the so called um, Lausanne syndrome. Uh, namely Turkey's efforts in recent years under the particular government to revise the geopolitical status quo that was brought about by the Treaty of Lausanne in its broader neighborhood. And this is contrary to the more widely known Severus Sev syndrome, which predicts a more, a more cautious brand of Turkey's foreign policy. It seems that the Lausanne uh, syndrome is associated with different political ideological uh, currents and predicts a more revisionist type of foreign policy behavior. Particularly with, uh, first of all, the impact of that Lausanne syndrome seems to uh, be projected in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East uh, of a particular state, Cyprus, Libya, Syria, uh, Syria and Iraq. And with regard to Greece, through the narrative of the Blue Homeland, we had a particular uh, presentation on this 
it seems that Turkey challenges what has been agreed in terms of borders and sovereign arrangements uh, based on the clear-cut provisions of the Treaty of the Lausanne, creating thus a kind of, interlogers call it, a kind of a conditional sovereignty in the Aegean. Of course, there are certain analysts uh, who um, put that criticism, let's say, on the Treaty of the Lausanne um, on the Islamist, nationalist uh, camp in, in, in Turkey. Uh, Professor Akhtar has referred in his presentation uh, to the transformation of the state narratives in relation to Lausanne Treaty from the one of the founding fathers of the Republic who publicized Lausanne as a victory to one in 2010s presenting Lausanne as, as uh, a defeat, namely as a historical moment with devastating consequences where founders of the Republic sacrifice Islamic values and institutions in order to get recognition uh, in the West. And I assume that um, I've heard also that the goal of that, of that criticism is not really to challenge uh, the treaty, uh, which is the founding, founding document of the, of the modern Turkish state, but through this criticism to attack the Kemalists who have negotiated the treaty and so managed to rally their constituents around the flag of the Islamist nationalist camp, which would have done it obviously better. Where Greece stand? I think a, a bit closer to the Lausanne legacy. Um, Greece is a status quo state. It's happy with the provisions of the Lausanne Treaty, especially the ones regarding the territorial arrangements in the Aegean Sea. Uh, we have heard um, uh, previous speakers referring to uh, Greece now leaving any room for reinterpretation of, of the treaty. Um, does that mean that Greece is free from syndromes? Not really. I think Greece is, is burdened by what I call the no resolution syndrome meaning Greece is not willing to pay the compromise costs. Mustafa mentioned that. An agreement with Turkey may entail. Uh, even if that uh, agreement is based on international law. And how do we know the syndrome, whether the syndrome exists? We do. Um, if you go back at the EU summit in Brussels in 2004, the European Union, obviously with Greece's concession, had decided that the timetable set up by the EU summit in Helsinki, December 99, urging the two countries to solve their bilateral differences, or else agree by December 2004, to refer them to International Court of Justice, should be withdrawn. And Turkey was only asked to commit to good neighborly relations. Resources to the International Court of Justice in The Hague was not an obligation anymore. And progress on Turkey's membership would no longer be linked to the resolution of the dispute with Greece. What we don't know today is probably exactly to what extent that no resolution syndrome is at play. Uh, the government, which is expected to emerge from the forthcoming elections on June 25th, is not, at least in my view, characterized by a no resolution syndrome. And even better, the same seems to be applying to the major opposition party of radical left, to a certain extent Syriza, and also to a certain extent to the center left party, PASOK. And I conclude by asking, uh, what does it take for the Lausanne legacy to remain the basis for not only better relations between Greece and Turkey, but also for the resolution of the conflict? I think the, the, uh, the Lausanne Treaty has made evident two particular things which are of particular importance today. First, how a rules-based regime can be built based on, a comprom based on compromises the states involved had agreed to make. Number two, I found it particularly interesting, how bilateral issues 
can be addressed through multilateral schemes. And that brings me to my um, proposal for uh, supporting the idea of, uh, of um, uh, the multilateral conference in the Eastern Mediterranean proposed by the European Union. It regards the delimitation of the maritime boundaries uh, of the Eastern Mediterranean, which is the key issue for dealing with current instability in the region, uh, with the rationale of this particular initiative being uh, on how states can be made, how, how, how such an agreement can make states of the region realize that the costs in following unilateralist policies due to the dominance of balance of power considerations exceed the benefits of possible payoffs they could collectively achieve if more cooperative relationships were chosen. Moreover, by including all littoral states to a mutually beneficial partnership, it will also engage Turkey and give it incentives to collaborate with neighboring EU member states and the European Union based on international treaties, in particular the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. Um, this way, I think uh, a, a, new, a new item has been added in the list of, uh, of uh, items of the legacy of the Lausanne Treaty, which has already been mentioned. Uh, which uh, I think coincide with, with the words of uh, J.F. Kennedy, uh, which I think should function as a driving force or as a, as a driver or of change for, for both countries. Things do not happen, things are made to happen. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Tsakonas, and especially for, you, you, I, I think your intervention brought about a, a, a new, not, not, not a really new idea, but a, a, a new element in this discussion uh, about the legacy of the Lausanne Treaty, that Lausanne Treaty might be a paradigm of um, dealing with bilateral issues through multilateral schemes. Uh, other than that, I think that the last presentation met the first presentation by Mustafa Eddin in singling out the main obstacle, which is the, the fear of compromise, and bringing about uh, uh, an optimistic note as to uh, whether we have in front of us a, a new window of opportunity.